Okay, so again, thank you everyone for staying uh, for the rest of the talks in this afternoon. I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Brittany, one of um, um, Henry's PhD students. Uh, she's going to talk about this assistant to extract nonlinear statistics from optical flow. Over to you, awesome. Brittany. Awesome, thank you so much, Aras. So hello everyone, thanks again for coming and sticking around for the talks. So today, as Aras said, I'll be presenting on zigzag persistence to extract nonlinear statistics from optical flow. And this is a paper that I worked on with Henry Adams, my research advisor, as well as my research siblings, Jonathan Bush, Lara Kassab, and Joshua Mirth. And these slides are actually modified from a talk that Joshua gave, I think a little bit ago before we did some more investigation of the topic. So let's get started as soon as my buttons work. There we go. Okay, so at first we'll address what optical flow is for anyone who doesn't know. We'll talk about the data set we use to come up with our model. We'll talk a little bit about the analysis we did and finally the results. So what is optical flow? Optical flow is how pixels change corresponding to how a subject is moving and how a camera is moving. So if you picture a car driving across the road that you're recording and you turn with the car, you have this idea of where the pixels are moving to show this motion that you're trying to capture. So the way we represent this is as a sequence of vector fields. So for each pixel in a given frame, we associate a vector with it to where that pixel appears to move in the next frame. So this is a problem that we're trying to develop algorithms to estimate optical flow from video sequences. And the whole reason we'd want to do that is things like facial recognition, autonomous cars, robotics, and a bunch of other things that need to capture information about the three-dimensional space given just a two-dimensional moving image. But we have some issues that arise with trying to recapture this problem. So the first thing is that this problem is ill-posed. So if you look at the example of the barbershop pole on the left, if any of you who have actually experienced a barber pole, you know that all it's doing is turning around and those stripes that appear to be moving are just a result of this cylinder rotating. But if you just look at a single pixel, the actual motion that it could be capturing is just that that um, pixel is sliding up vertically. And so if you're going to have an algorithm that estimates your optical flow, it's going to have to make an assumption about which is going to be more likely. So we wanna determine a way to test which is going to be more likely. And the way we're going to do that is by encoding optical flow data as a point in Rn, which is going to give us a space of optical flow data. So since we are topologists and data scientists, the topological slash geometric structure of dense subsets of this space might reveal some plausible assumptions. So if we can gain an idea of the underlying structure of the data, we can say something about which assumption we want to make. Okay, so if we're going to construct a model, we need a data set to work with. And there are some other data sets that have been around for a while. So for example, the Middlebury data set is just, there's a bunch of stuff with very small movements. There's a Kitty data set, which is a car that was driving along, taking images, and then has additional equipment to actually evaluate the ground truth optical flow. So the stuff that's actually going on in reality. And there's also an additional data set called the Roth and Black data set, which has both images and distances for the camera. But all of those aren't really realistic and they don't necessarily have the level of complexity that we wanted to use for our data set. So since optical data, optical flow data is hard to obtain, why not just create something on a computer that gives us the actual optical flow data? So the data set we worked with is something called Cintel, which is an open source animated film made with Blender. And what Blender is, is it actually constructs the 3D image that you're trying to capture and then records over it your video image. So let me give you an example of what a clip of that looks like. So like I mentioned before, the film is animated and unlike other animated data sets that we've seen before, it actually is kind of realistic, right? There's these drastic motions, there's the subtle little intricacies, there are texture differences, movement differences, camera angles, zooming in and out, and they're all very dramatic. So you can actually have some high contrast flow, which is more realistic to what we're trying to capture with real world images. And unlike everything else where we have to have other tools and resources to measure optical flow, 
the actual optical flow is already built in since we constructed it with a computer. Okay, so we have this huge data set and it's about a 30 minute film. So we have a bunch of scenes to pick from. And so the first thing we're going to do is randomly sample 400,000 points of three by three patches from the 1,041 fields in the Sintel data set. So we have all of these optical flow vector fields and from there we're going to pick three by three patches and look at what those are going to show us about our data. So the patches contain both vertical and horizontal flow components. So we have movement that could be horizontal or vertical or a combination of the two. So we're going to take all of that information for each patch and we're going to rearrange that into a length 18 vector. From there, we want to focus specifically on high contrast patches. So we're going to have to compute the contrast norm and normalize a little bit. So to give you an idea of what I mean by contrast norm, you could picture something with low contrast norm being a patch where all of the vectors are pointed in the same direction and they're very short. So nothing's moving fast and it's all kind of moving the same direction. Whereas a high contrast patch would have something like maybe a drastic movement down and then another movement to the right, which would give us a lot more information about the optical flow at that specific patch. For computational feasibility, we then want to randomly downsample to 50,000 data points, just so we don't go too crazy. And last but not least, we want to pull out a dense core subset using the kth nearest neighbor estimator. So to describe this process, think about if we were trying to sample the population of any country. All of the places that have really high density of people, if we were to randomly select people, we'd probably get a very dense subset here and here maybe. And then maybe if it was in America, in Wyoming, we'd only have one or two people just because the population density is so much lower. We wanna focus specifically on the dense subsets. So I might eliminate outliers like, sorry, the people in Wyoming. Okay, so if we're going to use this data set, we're going to have to have some algebraic topo topology tools in order to evaluate what's going on. So specifically, we need to address this idea of fiber bundles. So for those who aren't familiar, a fiber bundle consists of spaces F, E, and B, where F is going to be the fiber, E is going to be our total space, and B is going to be our base space. Where if I look at the pre-image of B, it's going to locally resemble B cross F. So let's specifically look at a fiber bundle over S1. So in this case, right, the base space is in pink, so it's that circle that goes around the torus kind of up and down. The example of a fiber is going to be in red, so that's the one that's wrapping around the torus, kind of like a ring around it. That doesn't really make sense, we have a bunch of circles. But the torus is going to be a circle's worth of circles. And just to check that our intuition makes sense, if I was to look at the pre-image of S1, that would give us S1. And if I cross that with my fiber, S1, I get S1 cross S1, which is exactly what my torus is. But fiber bundles can be a little misleading because this is not the only possibility I get for a circle's worth of circles. I could also have something like the Klein bottle because the Klein bottle is also a fiber bundle over S1 with fibers S1, but we have this weird twist that we've introduced to our data set. So whereas before we just connected it together, this one we connect it via this weird twist thing. So if we're gonna have a model and we know it's going to be a circle's worth of circles, we're going to have to be able to distinguish whether or not we're looking at a torus or whether we're looking at a fiber bundle. I mean, pardon, whether we're looking at a Klein bottle. So it seems like I'm speaking to a bunch of people who are already familiar with topological data analysis. So we won't spend too much time on this first part, but just a quick refresher for anyone who's not. So our entire goal is to take a data set and turn it into a topological space or a simplicial complex by, by thickening it. So if we start with a bunch of data points, we put an epsilon ball around them and then expand them until we hit another epsilon ball, and if two epsilon balls overlap, we have an edge, if three overlap, we have a face, etc. So the whole point of this for our purposes is that we want to turn this topological space into a vector space. Specifically, we want to look at h sub 1 of x, such that the dimension is the number of loops in x. And this is going to be nice because for computational feasibility, we want to reduce it into something that's linear algebra based. So this simplicial complex is going to depend a lot on the amount of thickening or our scale parameter, the radius of those epsilon balls. 
But you can imagine if those balls got too big, well then we wouldn't really have a whole bunch of information because everything would just be connected. So to address this, we're going to instead look at persistent homology, which I think a few of the other speakers have already mentioned in some of their talks. But eventually what we wanna do is increase this epsilon ball bigger and bigger and bigger, starting from zero, going until everything overlaps to track how the loops evolve. And then if a loop, for example, like the one that's in the center of the circle, sticks around for a while, we know that's going to be a very important feature of our data set. So whenever we do this, we're going to have to have some idea of what our results are. So we can display those in two different ways. So the first, of course, being our persistence barcode, where the long bar at the top signifies that loop we had in the very middle of our data set. And all of these shorter bars are just little loops that might have appeared for a brief amount of time and then disappeared. The other way we could look at it is we could instead capture this as a persistence diagram, where it's our typical persistence diagram. We have birth, which is along the x-axis, death, which is along the y-axis, and of course you can't die before you're born, so everything below the line is not going to be involved. So just like we had this single long bar that indicated the hole on the previous example, now instead we're going to have that point in the upper left hand corner, which signifies that we're going to have some, a feature that is born really early, and then it dies really late. But the specific kind of persistence that we want to talk about and that we're going to use for our model is something called zigzag persistence. So suppose we've sampled a data set a bunch of different times. So we have maybe x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, which are all samples from the same data set. So what we want to do is look at a bidirectional sequence of spaces that turns into a bidirectional sequence of vector spaces that's going to track how these loops evolve. So, the example we have below, suppose you sample a slice of Swiss cheese, right? There are a bunch of holes, and if I was to do samples, maybe I sample around one hole, the circle hole, and maybe I sample around another hole, the triangle hole. Originally, I have no way of knowing if these two holes are going to be the same or not. I don't really have any idea of my underlying space. So the way I deal with that is I say, okay, I'm going to take these two things, and I'm going to these two samples, and I'm going to combine them together to get one bigger sample. So if I get this bigger sample and then I compute the persistent homology of it, then it's going to capture this idea that my circle and my triangle aren't directly on top of one another. They're kind of adjacent and off to the side. So this is actually capturing two holes instead of one hole. So we have some idea of what our space looks like without having to either do really, really large samples or resample our data set. So this is going to be the version that we actually need to come up for a model. Okay, so we have our tools. Let's talk about results. So the first thing we'll talk about is this horizontal flow circle. So I said we were going to sample the densest subsets. So originally, let's start with a 30% of points and compute the persistent homology. So we know we're going to get this circle, which is that long bar across the top of our persistence barcode. And the single long barcode is going to imply the circular, circular structure. So if you look at the data cloud that's below on the left, then you have this sphere looking object and you have this circle that's going around kind of in the middle of it. That circle is going to correspond to the horizontal flow circle. So if you look at the figure to the right, we have a bunch of arrows and all of those arrows are either pointing left or right. None of them are pointed at an angle or up and down. What this represents and what you can picture is that the majority of our movement in our camera angle is going to be in the horizontal direction. Humans are limited by gravity, right? So we could, for example, be running along the ground. Your head is a swivel, so that would mimic a camera swivel. So you're looking from left to right a lot more often than you're going to be looking diagonally or up or down. So this feature that we can see within our data is this horizontal flow circle. And that tells us that this is going to be the most common direction in which our camera movement is happening. But now we want to capture some more information. So we're going to sample a bigger subset of our data we're gonna sample 50% of the densest points. And we wanna note how the structure is going to change. So in order to do this, we're going to use PCA to associate a flow angle to each data point. So on the last example, we had a bunch of different angles, but the one that really stood out was the horizontal one. Now we can instead look at a bunch of different angles going from maybe horizontal up to vertical and doing all the diagonals in between. So we'll split these into different flow angle bins and then perimeterize the data set by a circle. 
makes sense, right? We have a bunch of different angles. And then if we're looking at all possible angles, that's going to give us a circle. So we'll compute the persistence of the points at each angle. So if we did that, an example of our calculation is done below. So we have again the circle's worth of data. And this is going to measure the angle separating the foreground and the background. So specifically, I'll go back to the previous slide. And you can see how we have these arrows that maybe for the ones on the leftmost and rightmost point in the circle, they're all going like this. Whereas above, we have arrows that are going like this. So that angle between the arrows represents the angle between our foreground and our background. So for this 50% sample of densest points, and we're looking at all of those different angles, well, we're going to get a circle's worth of them. So if that's the case, we want to figure out, are these circles going to glue together? Or are we going to have more of a Swiss cheese type model that I talked about when we were doing zigzag persistence? OK, so if we're going to use zigzag persistence, we need to build our zigzag filtration. So we're going to take all these angle bins that we split up into. We actually use 12 different angle bins, where xi is the complex constructed from the eighth, eighth angle range at scale parameter 1. So we'll take all these different angle bins, and then we'll actually overlap them and look at the union of those two bins. We'll compute the zigzag homology using Dionysus. And turns out what we get is no surprise, because my title was talking about a torus. We're going to end up getting a single hole. So these are all talking about the same circle. So what this tells us is that this is going to be a fiber bundle over S1 with S1 fibers. OK, so we figured out that we have a circle's worth of circles. We figured out that it's going to be this fiber bundle. But like I talked about before, now we have to identify which one it is. Is it going to be a torus or is it going to be a Klein bottle? So we have to actually do a classification. And so what we'll do is we're going to sample a collection of patches near the idealized optical flow torus. So we're assuming we have a torus model from some of our other work. And in order to test that we actually do have a torus model, we're going to pick some patches near this optical flow torus. We'll compute our persistent homology of a witness complex construction with Z mod 2Z and Z mod 3Z coefficients. So we'll compute our witness complex. And from there, we're going to compute our homology for using coefficients Z mod 2Z and Z mod 3Z. Because the nice thing about doing this is that if we have a torus, we're going to end up getting the same Betty numbers, so B sub 0, B sub 1, and B sub 2, for both Z mod 2Z and Z mod 3Z. Whereas if we were to do it with the Klein bottle instead, then these would actually change. We would get different Betty numbers for Z mod 3Z, even though they would be the same as the torus for Z mod 2Z. So when we did that computation, as you can see in our picture below, we ended up getting 1 for dimension 0, we get two for dimension one and one for dimension two. So as those of you familiar with this know, this is actually going to give us our torus model. So even though we were starting with something that looks a lot crazier and all of these different optical flow patches, we really only have a few options for what those optical flow patches are going to be. They're going to be the patches that live on the torus. So if we wanted to actually reconstruct the ground truth optical flow and get some idea about which assumptions we can make, so going back to the barber pole, this might give us some intuition as to whether or not those pixels are moving up or those pixels are moving around, because the ones that are moving around should typically fall in line with that torus model, whereas these might be, if the pixel was moving up, it might constitute more of an outlier. Okay. So thank you so much for your attention, and I am open to any questions you all have. Uh, hello. Do you have a, a picture, two-dimensional picture of these uh, uh, patch, patches? Yes. So let me, instead of just a patch, let me give you an example of an actual whole scene, because I think that'll give us a little bit more intuition. So let me pull up the paper. Bring your shared window to the front. Reason share. Hold on, let me stop share real quick and then reshare. That should work. Okay. So if I scroll down, so the figure on the left is a sample of optical flow extracted from the database. 
So these high contrast patches are the ones that have this drastic, drastic color shift. So for example, the white versus black is showing us that we have this severe motion where maybe the foreground is going drastically to the left, whereas the background is going more drastically to the right. So you can see two examples from there. Does that answer your question? Uh, okay, I, I was just wondering about this uh, um, three by three patches because you, you had a, a picture that uh, basically was describing a cycle, a cycle, one dimensional cycle. So I was wondering if you have a, like a two dimensional uh, family of, of patches describing these torus. Gotcha. So now that I think I understand your question more, I will pull your attention and let me see if I can zoom a little bit to this figure up here. So what, in a different paper, what my advisor along with his collaborators found is that oftentimes these patches that we're getting a circle's worth of data from correspond to the fact that most of the time we have this very obvious split between our foreground and our background. So on this example right here, the white regions are background and the black regions are foreground. So we have this drastic line where all of the foreground stuff is in the um, upper right corner if we're looking at this patch right here and all of the background stuff is in the left corner. And it turns out to be a trend that this line is actually going to follow a circle's worth. So instead of having this weird discrepancy between foreground and background that's you know, a little more random where we could have pixels with gaps in between, it's actually more of a distinct divide. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah. I got a question real quick, Brittany. Yeah, Ravi, what's up? Uh, so, I, if I understand correctly, when you're doing this motion tracking type thing, you're following the pixels as they move across the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had an object that was coming closer or further away from the camera, it would naturally, like that pixel would kind of like dilate or contract in a way because it's like going to be discretized more or less as it gets like closer. So how, do, how does that factor into this kind of like foreshortening in perspective? Gotcha, that's an excellent question. So one of the things that we um, focused on in this paper was specifically this idea of camera motion. And there, and this specific type of camera motion was worried more about the panning of cameras going up and down. But we also know that there are other types, like you mentioned, you can zoom in, zoom out, and you can also do a roll. So you could like be rotating around if you want some funky camera effects. So in our paper specifically, we didn't really address those effects, but there are similar applications that you can do to try to look at a model for those specific effects. But for the Taurus, we were specifically focused on this idea of movement left, right, up, down in combination with the two. Okay, in the data set, but not with enough frequency to, uh, to affect our model. 